Biomass heating systems experience economies of scale. On the whole, the bigger they are, the less they cost per kilowatt. Their output is roughly proportionate to their capacity, so the value that must be re realized per megawatt hour of heat in order to justify the cost of the system decreases exponentially with size. The chart shows an approximation of the relationship between capacity on the x-axis and the required value of each megawatt hour of output in order to justify the investment on the y-axis. These figures are not precise, and they are not the same thing as the level of support that is required. Biomass heating systems yield some value without any support, primarily the fuel cost saving relative to the fossil fuels that would otherwise be used, but also less price volatility and less dependence on areas of the world such as the Middle East and North Africa, Nigeria, Venezuela and Russia. The RHI is intended to provide the support that technologies need, rather than to value the carbon savings they provide. For the purposes of this presentation, we will ignore the flawed economics underlying that approach and assess the RHI according to its own intentions. To differentiate the varying needs, the RHI was banded by technology and use. In the case of some uses of some technologies, such as the non-domestic use of biomass, it was also banded to take crude account of the economies of scale. Biomass boilers were divided into three arbitrary bands, less than 200 kilowatts, 200 to 999 kilowatts, and 1 megawatt upwards. Within each band, the same level of support applies regardless of whether the capacity of the technology lies at the bottom or the top end of the range. The level of support is set according to DEX calculations of the average level of support required by biomass heating systems within that range. Ignoring for these purposes the knowledge problems in making such calculations and some significant failures that occurred in the implementation, particularly for large biomass. The dashed black line on the chart shows something equivalent to DEX calculation, but expressed in terms of the total value per megawatt hour required to justify the investment, rather than the level of support, but they are functionally equivalent. If systems from 10 kilowatts to 199 kilowatts generate the same value per megawatt hour, and that value is determined by the average required by systems across the size range, then systems at the top end of the range will generate much more value than is required to justify the investment. Taxpayers will be paying more than is required to deliver the systems at the top end of the range in order to subsidise excess profits for the users who are fortunate enough to have a use for a boiler of that scale. The areas of excess profit are shaded green in the chart. The bigger the vertical gap between the dashed black line and the solid blue line, the bigger the excess profit at that scale. Conversely, the systems at the bottom end of each band will receive less support than is required to justify investment in heating systems of that size. The purple areas show the extent of the gap where the average for the band is insufficient. This doesn't mean that people wouldn't install systems in the purple zone. People may choose to accept a lower return because of their convictions, or there may be peculiar circumstances at a site that increases the value. But there is a strong bias towards the larger systems and against the smaller systems within a band, which bears no relation to the distribution of opportunities. In particular, there is a powerful disincentive to install a boiler that is at the bottom end of the medium or large bands, rather than to downsize the boiler to squeeze into the top of the band below, regardless of the optimum size on an engineering basis. And even where the opportunity is large enough to fall in the green zone of the medium or large bands, the excess value per megawatt hour is so much greater at the 199 kilowatt scale than at the 500 to 999 kilowatt scale that there is a powerful incentive to look for ways to subdivide the opportunity, even though doing so is economically inefficient in the absence of the banded incentive. It is no surprise that the RHI is being dominated by a flood of 100 to 200 kilowatt biomass heating systems, which bears no relation to the distribution of capacities that would be installed without the skewing effect of the RHI. Digression is the mechanism that is supposed to deal with imbalances in the RHI that are encouraging runaway growth within a band. Let's see what happens if support for small biomass is digressed a couple of times, as seems likely. The orange areas indicate the capacities that are particularly disadvantaged by the banded structure of the RHI. When the level of support for small biomass is reduced, the orange area widens, the green area shrinks, and the purple area grows. 
In other words, within the digressed band, the mid-sized systems become uneconomic like the small systems, which become even less economic, while the large systems continue to offer generous profits. Digression has failed to tackle the incentive to install systems at the top end of the band, but it has killed the sizes that weren't being excessively rewarded in the first place. It will take several digressions before the flood of 199 kilowatt boilers is abated, at which point all sizes below that will be deeply uneconomic. For a system that is supposedly designed to provide the level of support that projects need, the RHI is particularly ineptly designed. Banding always has this effect. It's simply bad maths and bad economics. If systems are to be supported according to need rather than worth, it isn't difficult to design a system that aligns the support more closely with the need across the range of capacities. A combination of a flat amount regardless of capacity paid early and a single low tariff per megawatt hour regardless of capacity can give a support trajectory that approximates the level of support required by typical heating systems of all capacities. Looking at this in terms of the average level of support over 20 years, rather than the overall benefit required to justify investment, the RHI looks like this. The average cost of the alternative scheme over 20 years is illustrated with the blue line. It's obvious which one costs the taxpayer more. Because the RHI offers the greatest rents at the 199 kilowatt scale, and has therefore delivered most at that scale, the weighted average cost of the RHI for biomass heat across all the bands is towards the top end of the three steps at over £60 per megawatt hour. A more rational scheme, such as that shown in the blue line, would see a more even distribution of capacities, and the weighted average cost would be likely to be in the range £25 to £35 per megawatt hour. The next chart illustrates the internal rate of return from investing in biomass heating systems at a range of capacities assuming RHI payments according to the current system and reasonable fuel cost savings. The intention of the RHI is to provide returns of around 14% for suitable systems. You can see how badly it is failing to do that. Consider instead an incentive that paid £100 per megawatt hour for the first 600 megawatt hours of the project's life and then £19 per megawatt hour for all subsequent output, regardless of the size of the system. Smaller systems take longer to get to 600 megawatt hours and therefore get 100 pounds per megawatt hour for a larger proportion of the output over 20 years. Such a scheme would offer returns along the lines indicated by the blue line in the chart in the range 14 to 17 percent. The gap between the blue and orange lines indicates the excess profits subsidized by the taxpayer at different sizes under the RHI compared to a more proportionate system. An easier way to visualise that excess is to look at the total payments under the RHI compared to the alternative scheme. The RHI is un unnecessarily expensive from 50 to 999 kilowatts, particularly at the top end of the small and medium bands. Another way to look at it is the payback periods required to break even on the investment in the heating system. The RHI provides erratic payback periods but in the sweet spots at 199 and 999 kilowatts, the investment is repaid in four years. On a 20-year contract, that gives 16 years of unnecessary taxpayer cost beyond recouping the investment. The alternative option also offers quite short payback periods, but mostly nearer to six years. Significantly, the RHI keeps paying the same amount every year for 20 years, whereas the alternative scheme drops to much lower payments once the initial 600 megawatt hours have been generated. The excess profits beyond the payback period are therefore much lower. The final chart demonstrates how much lower. The RHI costs twice as much as necessary across most of the range from 100 kilowatts to 999 kilowatts. At the 199 kilowatt sweet spot, the RHI costs 175% more than necessary to provide a worthwhile return. No wonder we are seeing such a rush at that scale. Nice rent if you can get it. Not everyone can. The RHI is carefully designed to make sure that such rents are not available to the general public. 199 kilowatts is much too big for a domestic system, 
And anyway, the domestic RHI is less than half as generous as the non-domestic RHI, even though smaller systems are more expensive, and the non-domestic system itself is not especially economic for domestic scale systems. The RHI is designed so that certain privileged groups can benefit from the rent more easily than the rest of society. The ideal opportunity is a set of buildings whose heat demand can easily be divided into discrete 199 kilowatt chunks. Big poultry businesses are a particular beneficiary. So are several types of public sector institutions such as schools and council buildings. It is not clear why these organisations deserve generous rent that is not available to most heat users, particularly when some of them have other incentives to drive their choices, such as the CRC. The principle of policy grandfathering means that the excess profits are locked in for 20 years once the systems are installed. Even if the RHI is modified or repeatedly digressed, the cost of the original inefficient design and the rush it created will be locked in for 20 years. Digression may reduce the cost of new projects within the narrowed range of capacities that are viable, but it will have only a marginal effect on the cost and the amount of heat that the budget can support, because by definition the budget will already be overstretched by the time that digression applies. There are a number of ways that the upfront value proposed in the alternative scheme could be implemented in practice. Italy has been much more effective than the UK at growing its biomass heat sector at low cost through the use of 50% tax relief on the capital cost for domestic customers and low-cost loans for industrial customers. Germany used capital grants to drive growth in the sector much more effectively than the UK. The advantage of providing a higher tier for the first megawatt hours is not only that it provides a more accurate correlation between cost and support, but also that it spreads the cost to the exchequer of the higher upfront amount over a longer period than would be the case with grants, tax relief or subsidised loans. But tax relief might be politically preferable, as it is effectively off-balance sheet for the Treasury. Although for the country's bottom line, a larger amount of lost tax revenue sooner is more expensive than the cost of an equivalent subsidy that is spread over a longer period of time. What all the countries that have grown their biomass heat sector efficiently have in common is a much greater fuel cost difference between fossil fuels and renewable fuels, even though the renewable fuels are cheaper in the UK than they are in those countries. Sweden has probably the most effective energy policy in Europe. It was able to hit its 2020 target of 50% renewable energy throughout the economy, well ahead of schedule, with biomass heat as one of the main contributors. Driven largely by the fuel cost differential thanks to their long-standing carbon tax and energy tax policies. The fuel cost differential is also much greater in Italy and Germany, which significantly reduces the amount of grant funding or tax relief required. The UK, on the other hand, effectively subsidised domestic fossil fuels through our tax policies, which artificially reduces the fuel cost differential. The long-term, lower-cost tariff can be seen as effectively a carbon price, and a cheap one at that at £19 per megawatt hour, but also as a necessary correction to the favourable treatment that fossil fuels receive under the UK tax regime compared to other countries. In an ideal world, the UK would do away with such discrepancies, in which case the increased fuel cost differential would allow a reduction in the level of upfront support required. The objectives should be to move to a point where biomass heating systems are justified solely on the strength of the fuel cost differential, the carbon value, and intangibles such as the security and stability benefits. That is a realistic prospect in the medium term, if more sensible policy were adopted promptly.